welcome Dr. Kamenian to the platform.
first thing they did was they, they noticed that if they stuck a needle, this is, this is a cell, by the way, this is a bacteria cell. And they noticed that if they stuck a needle inside the cell, they were able to actually measure that voltage. The voltage, which is, gives you the electricity of light. So, naturally, everybody would want to go with it. Gee, you know, if we're generating our own electricity, if we're at Con Ed plants, uh, where, does that, where does that voltage come from? So, as they studied it, you know, Hodgkin and Huxley and, and Burton studied it, they uh, studied it and they noticed that if you look on the inside of the cell, there's lots of this stuff called K. And it went to the outside of the cell, there was much less of this stuff called K, and that's the element potassium. But the unique thing about potassium is it carries a one plus charge. And so it's electrically active. And on the inside, there was 150 K. On the outside, there was only 4 K. If you put that into a well-known uh, equation called an Ernst equation, lo and behold, you've got the same voltage that you, that you measured when you stuck a probe. OK, so they had the beginning. That's where the voltage was coming. It's coming, it coming up from this concentration of this atom that had a charge of potassium. But the curious thing was that if you looked outside the cell, you had the opposite. You had sodium, another atom, with a one plus charge, 140 on the outside, and sodium uh, four on the inside. Well, gee, that's a strange thing. I mean, why potassium and not sodium? Why was potassium getting in and not sodium getting in? And uh, initially, people were uh, quickly puzzled by that, and somebody, the same group, Hodgkin and Huxley, without much in the way of evidence, said, well, there must be on the surface of the cell a pump, a pump that pumps potassium in, and it pumps sodium out, and it's a protein. Well, I got interested in that, and I said, all right, well, as I started off my career in science, I said, well, you know, uh, maybe I, I should try to find that pump and see if I can isolate it and purify it. And so the professor I was working with at the time, uh, I, I asked him, uh, this was during the years I was at Harvard, and I asked, his name was Dr. Song. He said, well, good, he came to the right lab. I said, I want to isolate the sodium pump. So he said, uh, the way we uh, want to go about that, Dr. Bain, is that we want to make a bacteria, two bacteria, a normal bacteria and a mutant. And we're going to make a mutant that can't pump potassium. And since we know this is a protein, if we compare the parent strain and the mutant together and fractionate and measure all its proteins, we will find out um, which protein is dissimilar between the two, and that will be our sodium pump. So that's a good idea, Dr. Solomon. Uh, and I said to him, now, uh, this pump, though, it's a very sensitive, it's a very sensitive animal. Uh, how do I know that anything that's missing this pump can live? And if it can't live, I'll never be able to find it. I won't be able to isolate it. And he said to me, uh, that's your problem, Dr. Payne. So uh, anyway, I proceeded as he uh, suggested. And I, uh, in about six months, I did indeed isolate a mutant of that bug, the E. coli bug. And now I had what he had proposed. I had the back, I had the mutant, I had the parent strain. And now I could break them up, fracture them, and look for that dissimilar protein, the, which would be my pump. So I saw it when I was there. After I finally got it, I spent another six months at Harvard looking for that uh, protein, couldn't find it. And I was uh, taken into the Air Force at the School of Aerospace Medicine uh, in Texas, and I spent another two years. Because fortunately, my uh, commander, Colonel Luke Bitter, was interested in the fact that we had this mutant, and I spent another two years looking for this pump. And then finally, I joined Blackley at the State University of New York. And I looked another six months, and I still no pump. I'm looking everywhere, fractionating everything on the planet. I'm not finding this pump. So finally, it just suddenly occurred to me. I said, you know, Remy, you ought to be sure that the evidence for the existence of the pump is real. Because if it's not strong evidence, you'll be looking for the rest of your life and you don't find it. So I then started going into the research, and, and uh, researching in the library in great detail. And lo and behold, I run up across a book written by Gilbert Link that says there is no pump. And as I was looking at it, uh, I eventually came to the conclusion, well, you know, actually, you don't need the pump. Because this potassium has got a plus charge. It can stick to stuff on the inside of the cell that's a negative charge. And that's how it'll build up. But still have that one question. Why potassium is going to stick and not the sodium is going to stick? I looked up some materials that are the chemists were making these things called ion exchange resin beads, little beads you put inside a big glass column. And you pour water in a chemical solution through the column. And it goes through the column and through these beads called ion exchange resin beads. 
and it separates until the chemist can fractionate the samples as they come out, and those are called ion exchange residues. I said, oh, okay. Well, that would work for me, too. I can, these, these things that you see here are loaded with pr uh, proteins, nucleic acids, they're loaded with negative charges, and based on the amount of water, when, when potassium travels around, it doesn't travel around new. It travels around with a clothing of water. And when sodium travels around, it doesn't travel around new either. It travels around with a big coat of water. Well, it turns out that when sodium has got the full complement of water, it's bigger than when potassium is with the cold complement of water. So what happens is the cell ends up picking the smaller one that's fully hydrated. So after all of this, then I published a paper called the Ion Exchange Resin Model, eliminating the pump, and said this is a new approach. And when that happened, I got a phone call from Dr. Freeman Cope, Freeman Thorndike Cope. Um, and his mother was the grandmother wrote the Thorndike Dictionary. He said, Dr. Mato, I read your papers. How would you like to collaborate with me and see if we can prove your theory of the ion exchange resin? So, oh, that sounds like a good idea, Cope. What do you what, what, what do you think? He said, Well, I'm using this new technology at the Naval Air Development Center where I'm working called NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance. We can take some samples, we can put the bumps on the test tube, we can put them on the inside, we can measure the potassium and see whether or not it's bound or free. And if it's bound, then your theory will be correct. I said, okay, sounds like a good idea, Cole. Let's get together. So we did get together. Now he said one thing. He said, call me up a few days later after the He said, I'm worried about one thing, Dr. Mayer. So what's that, Freeman? He said, well, you know, he said, uh, potassium doesn't have that all that strong a signal, the nuclear magnetic resonance signal that we're going to be depending on to measure the potassium is not that strong. And secondly, you know, in reality, there isn't all that much of, on the inside of the cell, so maybe we won't even get a signal. Well, I said, Cole, maybe I can help on that one. He said, well, what do you, what do you mean, uh, Randy? I said, well, I know of a bacteria that I can get from the Dead Sea called Halobacter holobi that has 20 times the normal potassium. And that should uh, uh, increase our chances of being able to get an NMR signal from potassium. It's good. Can you get it? I said, oh, I don't know. I, I'll look for it. So I went searching for it, and I got some of the bacteria. And when you grow them up, they're pink. And that's kind of interesting, because when you go to the, uh, when you go to the promised land uh, in the evening, and you look at the Dead Sea, the, the, uh, the, the Dead Sea is pink. OK. So I joined with Cope, and we were able to measure the potassium with these halobacter halobium, and we got a very shortened uh, decay time on the signal, which was pretty, pretty good proof that, yes, indeed, the potassium was in the not because of the pump, because it's sticking to negative charges on the inside. Now, what's the apparatus look like? Well, this is the apparatus here. That's the electronics uh, that I was originally using, and what you do is you take your test tube sample, and you put it inside a magnet, just like that. And so when Cope and I were doing that, and uh, by the way, I had never seen this apparatus before, I said, uh, we, we put our sample inside there with our bacteria in there, and uh, Dr. Cope put it inside the magnet, and in an instant, we got a signal, and we measured it. And I said, Cope, I can't believe what you just did. You just took a test tube, you put it inside the magnet, and in milliseconds, you measured that potassium, something that would take me normally two or three days, but I didn't drop the test tube. I said, I can't believe it. And not only that, you did it non-invasively. You did it with an antenna, antenna wrapped around the outside. And you'll get the chemistry of that sample without ever biting. I said, Cope, I said, you know what? I said, by joke, if you could do the same thing on a human body, you would spark an unprecedented revolution in medicine. Because you, mean you, could put the tank, you could put the antenna outside the body, and you could go from one tissue to the next and just scan the whole body and measure the chemistry without ever invading the body. Well, he thought it was off the wall. so. Uh, he didn't really want to collaborate and go uh, on that. So I, uh, I spoke to the president of the company with Paul Yaiko, was his name, and I said, listen, I have this idea that I might be able to measure things on the inside of the tube with antennas outside the body. Maybe we could detect cancer with it. I said, can I come back with some tissue samples that, can I come back to the company of New Pennsylvania, just on the outskirts of Pittsburgh, that will allow me to make these measurements, and can I use your equipment to do that? So Paul Yaiko said, sure. So I went home, I uh, grew up some, some tissue, some cancer tissue. <clears throat> oh, uh, just 
interject for a minute so you get an idea what uh, the way this apparatus works. Uh, you're going to see more of him in a minute, but that's Larry Minkoff who helped me build the first standard, Dr. Larry Minkoff. And he's sitting in that first ever MRI machine, and he's got that antenna that we built wrapped around him. Now, the important thing is when that antenna is wrapped around him, what's it doing? What's it picking up? Well, it's picking up a radio signal just like the radio on your ordinary uh, household radio. And I'm going to show you that signal. This is the signal that you pick up with the antenna that is when you're on the inside of the uh, MRI machine. This is literally the signal that we picked up. And it looks like that. You don't hear it because I just connected the output to an audio so you can hear it. You normally wouldn't hear it when you're sitting in an MRI machine, but that is what we are doing. We are collecting uh, the radio signals from the atoms of the body, and that's what is allowing us to determine disease. Okay, now, uh, so I went back to New Kensington, Pennsylvania, and I brought with me some test tube samples, of, not test tubes, actually rats, that had cancers in them, and I measured the signal on their normal tissue, and I measured the signal on cancer tissue, and I got a dramatically different result. So that if you looked at the cancer, the signal was much bigger. And if you looked at the normal, it was much smaller. And so what, what, the way, what that turns out is if we make maps of the body, the signal at its biggest is going to give me the brightest picture element, and I'm going to see it bright on the, uh, when I do the map, uh, and it's going to be much brighter than the surrounding healthy tissues, so I should be able to detect cancer. Now these are, these are the actual numbers where I measured the magnitude of the signal. And you see here, if I look at liver, and I look at what the tumor looked like, it, the signal lasted 826 milliseconds, whereas the normal was 293 milliseconds. The cancer signal was indeed much bigger than the corresponding normal tissue. And the same for another tumor, Walker, Walker sarcoma, as compared to muscle. And so the expectation was, and as I said, eventually, uh, the bigger signal where the tumor is should show up as a brighter spot on the image. And sure enough, when we did it, uh, we were able to see that there was a dramatic difference between the tumor and the surrounding tissue. And yes, indeed, we could scan the human body now with this new technology called nuclear magnetic resonance and pick up disease tissue. So we filed a patent in 1972, it was issued in 74, and at that point, because we were excited about this, we started building the first scanner, the one I showed you with Larry Minkoff sitting there. And here I'm with Dr. Michael Goldsmith and Dr. Michael Stanford, and we're winding a giant coil that a person's going to go inside of it. We actually wound two of them, one on each side of the human body, that would make these signals from the human body. So that's the first coil. Now, one of the curious, curious things about this is that we couldn't just use ordinary copper wire because we couldn't get enough current, enough amperes of current into the magnet to get the strength of the magnetic field which is going to be necessary to do this on a human being. So we had to use a special kind of wire. We had to use something we call superconducting wire. A wire that instead of taking 150 amperes to go through, we put thousands of amperes into it. Well, how'd you do that? Well, it was a special kind of wire. It was superconducting wire. Uh, the, the material was niobium titanium. And if you took that wire made out of niobium titanium and cooled it to liquid helium temperatures, which is minus 269 degrees centigrade, that wire would superconduct with no resistance, and you could put thousands of amperes into that back, into that. So this is the container then that went around the coil that was loaded with liquid helium to cool that wire so we could put thousands of amperes into it. And we finally got it all together, and here I am, the, the guys that uh, built it with me, Dr. Michael Goldsmith. Uh, please take note of his dimensions because he had some comments to make. I'm going to show you further in the history. And uh, Larry Minkoff, and we're standing in front of this first ever MRI machine. All right, well, we got it all together, and now it was time to get somebody to go in that magnet and prove the point. And the reality was we couldn't get anybody to win it. Um, <laughs> nobody wanted to be you know, the first one to try out how safe it was, what the magnetic field was going to do, what's the RF going to do. So the only one that uh, would go in there was, was me. 
So uh, you see I have the coiler that's gonna pick up those radio signals. I had a cardiologist around. I had uh, defibrillator shock paddles in case something went wrong. And all we got was a normal EKG. We got what the whole the rest of the world was saying that the whole thing was ridiculous anyway. And we did not get that all important critical signal. So I'm, I just want to remind you uh, of uh, Dr. Goldsmith and what he looked like. So when we failed, um, we didn't know why. And I had this antenna, and that was an antenna that Dr. Goldsmith had built. So when we were curious as to why it didn't work, Dr. Goldsmith had the temerity to say that I was too fat for his coin. <laughs> now that meant that we had to get a skinnier sample. <laughs> but he wouldn't get in there. So we labored over this and we did everything we could. And finally, one day on July 2nd, 1977, he walked in and says, okay, I'll get this scanner, but just to see if we can get a signal. So, by, we, so this, this magnet, we ended up calling it in, in dominance of bolt. We spent the whole day cooling it down with the liquid helium. And finally, by the time we were ready to get Larry Minkoff in there, it was midnight. Uh, and Larry got in just to see if we could get a signal. Well, lo and behold, we got him in there, and beyond our belief, we got a signal. And he was ready to get out, and there's no way that Goldsmith and I would ever let him out. So we kept him, we kept him in there for four hours and 45 minutes. And what we did was, there, there were, we had arranged the technology so in the dead center of the magnet is where the focal spot was. And that little spot that was about a centimeter sphere was the only region in the anatomy that would give a signal. So we knew it was localized. And then what we did was we took Larry and stepped him stepwise across that spot until we had a scan. And this is, this is the scan that we got from him. Now, when you're in the lungs, it's all air. There's no hydrogen. We're collecting a hydrogen signal. It's all air, so there's no signal in the lungs, uh, which it should be. And we were getting excited as we were doing this because we said, gee, it's doing, it's doing important. As we stepped across the lung, suddenly the sing, signal would disappear. We'd have signal in the body wall on the outside, but as we moved across in the scan, when we hit the lungs, it turned to zero. Then we got back to the heart, the signal came back, and we knew it was working. By 4.45 a.m., the morning of July 3rd, 1977, we were ecstatic. Lo and behold, this thing that had been considered visionary nonsense. In fact, at one point I was asked to give a lecture, um, and one of the things that the doctors, the chemists were doing at the time, they put a test tube in, and they would spin the tube at very high speeds in order to get the necessary magnet homogeneity to get a signal. And I gave a lecture somewhere, someone, and somebody stood up, after one of the doctors stood up, and I said, now, Doc, he said, how fast do you propose to spin the patient? Uh, those of you who've been in MRIs know that we don't spin the patient because we found ways to overcome that. But in any case, this then, July 3rd, 4.45 a.m., was the first ever MRI scan of, life, you know, of Larry's body. This is his chest wall around the outside. That's the heart in the center with the uh, chambers inside, and there are the lungs. <clears throat> and because of the huge differences in the tissue, one tissue to the next, with respect to the magnitude of this signal, what ended up happening is that the NMR became the most detailed images of the body's life-giving organs in history. Okay, well, here's a few of those. Here's a few. We couldn't get anything like this. Uh, if, when you, uh, with ordinary imaging with x-ray, the big problem is you could never see the soft tissues. They, were ne they weren't different. If you put a liver or a kidney or a spleen next to each other, you couldn't make any discrimination. But with the MRI, we've got exceptional detail. There's the liver, there's the kidney on the left side. When you got into the chest, there's the heart and the lungs uh, and uh, the aorta. And we're getting, as a result of these signal differences that the NMR gives us, all the technology gives us, we've got extraordinary image detail. There's an immense image detail in the center of the knee showing the, the, the femur uh, and the uh, cartilages that are connecting them uh, and the ligaments that are tying together. 
And the brain, exceptional detail showing the ventricles of the brain, uh, the gray matter and the white matter. <clears throat> now evolution, what about it? Well, it's simple. It violates all of the most fundamental laws of science. It violates the law of causality. What is the law of causality? The effect can never be greater than the cause. Oh, but there's our ancestor. We, under evolution, we, we, uh, we, we derived from him, the slime mold. He's, that's, that's our ancestor right there. Now, um, it, it, it's hard to say that this effect is not greater than the cause. And that's the law of causality. This effect. Uh, you know, our change and, and evolutionary change over time, uh, this effect became greater than our ancestor, the cause. So that's, that's the first violation, the law of causality. It violates the first law, of evolution violates the first law of thermodynamics, which is energy can be created. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Well, if I want to get him from him, I got to create energy. So that's a violation of the first law of thermodynamics. And it violates the second law of thermodynamics. What's that? The second law of thermodynamics says is throughout the time in the natural world, things are continuously disintegrating. They're not evolving, they're decaying, they're degenerating. Specifically, you take your car and you leave it outside for a year or six months, it doesn't shine itself into a Cadillac. It degenerates continually with rust. And that's the general uh, theorem of, of entropy of the second law of thermodynamics. Everything is running downhill. You can't expect them to, uh, these things, to just uh, change themselves because that's another violation of a fundamental law of science. And here you have uh, a direct violation because he's not running downhill. Over the theory of evolution, all of millions of years, we steadily went ahead and didn't disintegrate, but in fact we evolved into this uh, spectacular human structure called the human body. Now, under the theory of evolution, we came from, we came from him. He got successively bigger and, and more powerful, and then you know, he went from walking on his hands to standing upright, uh, and finally became a human being. That's how we evolved. Well, on the theory of evolution, if we came from the ape, if you were going to go from an ape that had 400 cc's of brain to a human being that had 1,200 cc's of brain, and if you're arguing that's where you came from, you're going to have some proof. You can't just Second, now there's only one kind of proof. You have to be able to show some intermediates. There's got to be somebody with 600 cc's of brain. There's got to be somebody with 800 cc's of brain. If you're going to go from 400 cc to 1200 cc's. And those are what you would call in the, theory, in the field of evolution, ILS, intermediate life forms. Well, when Darwin and others were looking, they couldn't find them. And they called them missing links. Well, the obvious question in this, in this context is, so how come they're missing? And if they're missing, did they ever exist? Did these intermediate life forms, did they ever exist? How come they're missing? If the Darwinian theory of evolution is correct, with these incremental changes one right after the other, to go, it should, the, the, these intermediate life forms and the evidence should go over the place. But even Darwin couldn't find it. Now this is what I'm talking about. If you look at the chimpanzee, the gorilla, and the orangutan, they all have around 400 cc's of brain. But the human has 400 cc's of brain. He jumped from 400 cc's to 1,200 cc's. How? God says he made us. Uh, that's the only way you're going to get there. You can't get there without him. And if you want to prove that you got there by evolution, then you've got to provide that evidence with intermediate life forms, that there were things in between that allowed you to slowly increment from 400 cc's to 1200 cc's, and you just can't, you just can't leave out that evidence, and you leave out that evidence, you have no proof for evolution. Uh, well, this is Mr. Darwin himself. 
And I'm going to read you some of his quotes now so you, you see what I'm saying. And this is the book he published in 1839, The Origin of the Species. Now, Darwin pointed out, I'm going to read you some of his quotes, that, uh, well, it's true that as I look around for evidence of these intermediate life forms, which should be numerous, we're not finding them anywhere. But maybe they got lost, maybe there's geological change, and you know, maybe uh, ultimately we'll find them. Well, it's been almost 200 years since he wrote his book, and we didn't find any of them. So where are they? Well, the evidence for evolution is simply non-existent. Now, I'm going to show you Darwin's quotes, because in that book that I just showed you, I'm going to read you the quotes from Darwin himself. Now, what does he say on page 146 in that book? He says, but as by this theory, there should be innumerable transitional forms, innumerable ILS. Remember, it's going little bit by little bit, increment by increment, and they must have existed. Why do we not find them embedded in countless numbers in the crust of the Earth? Darwin wants to know why he's not founding them and to be consistent with his theory. Well, it's been 200 years, nobody found them. Then he says on page 226, one of the problems, says he, Namely, the distinctness of specific forms and their not being blended together by innumerable transitional links is a very obvious difficulty of my theory, says Darwin. And then lastly, he proposes this concept of natural selection. Right? So there's going to be an accident, and some specific aspect of that individual is going to be more powerful, more selective, and when the competition starts getting going, he's going to beat out the next guy, and he is going to be naturally selected under the Darwin theory, and he's going to survive while the other people are going to die. All right, so he says, as far as the theory of his theory of natural selection, there should be an interminable, an endless number to prove my theory of the intermediate forms that must have existed, linking together all the species in each group by gradations as fine as our present varieties. So it may be asked, why do we not see these linking forms all around us? That's Darwin in The Origin of Species on page 226. So he's, he's articulating the very missing lack of evidence that doesn't exist for his theory. All right, well, here was somebody everybody got excited about, you know, they found the Neanderthal man in the northwest province of Germany next to, next to Dusseldorf, and that's the Neanderthal man. And oh, everybody got very excited. He must have 800 cc's. He must be one of these intermediate life forms. He must be one of these missing links. Well, except this problem. When they measured his brain capacity, he had 1,300 cc's, not 800, not 900. So they had to remove him as one of the missing links. And what did they find out when they started in the Montier? Well, first of all, he had a brain capacity, 1,300 cc's, that was greater than modern man. That's, that's hard to do when you're a missing link. He was discovered in the Neanderthal Valley, in Dusseldorf, Germany, as I told you, and look what he did with that 1300 CC. He lived in communities, he raised crops, he fashioned musical instruments, he employed the same musical scales we use today, he used weapons, they buried their dead, and they observed religious rites. Just as human as you or I, a 1300 CC of brain may be even more so. Okay, then in the UK, uh, the search was on to find some more missing links, and they found the Piltdown Man. And over a period of time, it was then determined that the Piltdown Man was turned out to be the greatest hoax in the history of science. Now, it was found by a gentleman named Dawson in 1912. He supposedly lived 500,000 years ago but it turned out to be the greatest hoax in scientific history. So another missing link dead. 
But let's look at the detail. Now, if you looked at the Piltdown Man, the things that they were able to find was his jaw bones, some skull fragments, and this is what uh, he looked like. They found that in 1907. However, in 1953, it was revealed that the jaw and the teeth probably belonged, actually, to a young orangutan, and that the teeth had been carefully filed flat to give the appearance of a human tooth and its wear. So that turned out to be a total hoax fiction. Now, what about some other problems? Okay. Now, we're going to start from nothing, remember? And we're going to have some electrical storms, and we're going to create some carbon fragments. We're going to use carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, which the building blocks of tissue. And well, maybe uh, by sheer accident, we get some amino acids. So now I'm going to talk about making the first protein. Now, this is an example of a protein, and a protein is a chain link fence. You take one chain piece, and you link another one to it, and another one to it, and you make it long enough, you get a big, long chain of them. And the smallest protein is a chain link fence of 50 of these, and each one of them is an amino acid. So if I make Purely by chance, the smallest protein possible of 15, uh, 50 uh, amino acids, um, purely by chance, I link them together. We don't, I haven't gotten into the details of how you link them together, and I'm going to get the first protein of 15 amino acids. But there's a problem. Now, the problem is if I take these amino acids, if I take, I say this guy, if I take uh, glycine, and I put them in water, and test tube of water, remember, doing everything purely by chance, I'm going to end up with two glycines. And what they're called is the D and the L glycine. Now, what does that mean? It means when I make a test tube of L glycine, it, it, and I put water through the L glycine test tube, it'll bend the light to the left. So it's called a Libro rotary amino acid. And if I take the other one that is dextro or dextro rotary, it'll take that same light and bend to the right. So if I've got a test tube with these two amino acids, D and L, um, and they're gonna, I'm not going to be able to have a solution of amino acids that doesn't have both of them. But there's a problem. This protein is only L amino acids. There's no Ds. So how am I going to, by chance, get 50 amino acids all in a row with only L and no D, purely by chance. It's not going to happen. Uh, next thing is you go to uh, graveyards and uh, look at mixed fossil graveyards. What do you do? You find graveyards have all everything in them. Amphibians, mammoths, dinosaurs, fishes. Uh, these are found all over the world. So the dinosaurs are sitting right there with human remains. How does that come about if he's, if he's uh, six, the dinosaur was 63 million years ago? Yeah. yeah. Okay, now the last piece that you, you need to understand in this creation evolution story is how we get geologic formation. And um, there was a few scientists that proposed the idea of uniformitarianism. You got the Grand Canyon, one grain of sand at a time. And so it took, uh, this is one grain of sand at a time, it took a long time and you need billions of years in order to make the Grand Canyon. Well, that's one approach. But the other approach, is, well, wait a minute, you just have a catastrophe. You have a volcanic explosion, and in, 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 in hours, you get the Grand Canyon. So Steve Austin, the Institute of Creation, we started to study that, and this is him, and this is Mount St. Raymond. And this is it before the explosion. This is Mount St. Raymond after the explosion, and within hours, you had, you had a, a, a canyon with a, a river running right through it by catastrophic geologic events instead of by um, uh, uniform terrain one grain of sand events. <clears throat> so within hours in Mount St. Helens, you've got 25 feet thick of stratified layers just in, in, uh, in less than one day. So with a catastrophic event, you have basically the, the, uh, what you could expect from the Grand Canyon. 
Now, what about this geologic time scale? The geologists have looked at sedimentary rocks over here. How old is the Earth now from these, from these sedimentary rocks? Uh, two and a half billion years old. And the dinosaurs occurred in the Mesozoic, the middle area, Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous, uh, and that's 145 million years ago. <clears throat> now, I was going to show you a picture, and I'm a little hesitant about it, so I'll just mention it. But a Japanese fishing boat a few years ago was traveling in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of New Zealand, and it trapped a dinosaur, um, an, an entity they call the plesiosaur. So this animal, which has been uh, captured in a number of different places now as a result, he's supposed to have occurred 65 million years ago, but they're catching him in the ocean today. Now, I'm not, I, I don't want to go too much into detail because the, the opponents are criticizing that in a variety of ways, so I'm not going to build a story too much on that, but I just want you to know uh, they are, there's evidence that some of these dinosaur-like characters, like the Pleiosaurus, uh, that are supposed to be uh, uh, 145 million years old, are swimming around in the, in the waters today. <clears throat> now, so when we talk about this debate, we're talking about creation in the debate versus evolution. Now, the absence of these ILFs, the absence of the intermediate life forms is fatal to the theory of evolution. There's no evidence. Now, how can you have a theory? The only way you can scientifically sub uh, support the theory is with evidence, and there's no evidence. No evidence, no evolution. All right, so uh, in the sum total, what do we have? Well, we start off with creation versus evolution. And the worldly analysis or assessment of that is that we're talking, when we talk about creation versus evolution, we're talking about religion under creation versus true science for evolution. Well, let's take a look to see how true that is. Because in actuality, it's not religion versus science, but it's genuine science versus science fiction. <laughs> so evolution is science fiction. I want you to know that because I'm here to protect you. Okay? All right, now here's the last quote from Charles Darwin, page 156. Now what does he say? He's talking about organs of extreme perfection, like the eye. And what he says is to suppose that the eye with all of its inimitable contrivances, such as adjusting the focus to different distances, such as admitting different amounts of light, such as the correction for spherical and chromatic errors, that these could have all been formed by natural selection seems, I freely consent, seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest possible degree. That's Darwin talking about his own theory, absurd in the highest possible degree. And let's see why he's worried, okay? This is the eye, okay? Now this is a cross-section of the front of the eye. This is a cross-section of the whole eye. And what is he really worried about? He says, okay, well, we're gonna use my theory of accidents, all right? And I'm gonna get a cornea right on the top there. Now, by my theory of natural selection, that cornea should make me more powerful than the rest of my buddies walking around. So I should, by natural selection, beat him out and uh, advance with my cornea. But there's a problem. The cornea, without the S to the eye, doesn't do anything at all. He's got to have an optic nerve. He's got to have rods and cones in the retina. He's got to go to the brain. That cornea doesn't do squat to him. So how is he, by natural selection, using the cornea, going to outlast the guy who doesn't have a cornea when the guy without the cornea is just like him. His cornea is not doing anything. And the same thing with the retina. How, he's, he, he has an accident. He gets a retina. You can believe that. So that, that, that's, that takes a lot of belief, too. But you have an accident, you get a retina. Well, the retina isn't going to do anything without the rest of the eye. It's not going to do anything without the logic cones of the, of the retina. It's not going to do anything you know, without the optic nerve. So how are these fine structures in the eye uh, going to progress by Darwin's natural selection. And you see what Darwin says, I, I have to freely confess, it's absurd in the highest possible degree. Thank you very much.
will um, um, I'm glad to call questions you. So anyone with questions, I'll bring the mic over to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I really appreciate it. Would it be fair to say in a species such as a fish that will only see uh, darkness, natural selection could then take away that complicated eye that it may have one set? Is that an accurate interpretation? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think what, what if you just speak generalities, the way to look at it is that Darwin did see changes but they were within the species. And then, with no evidence at all, he jumped from the species to a slime mold and got all the species in between with no evidence. What Darwin saw, and I'll give you the terminology for it, Darwin saw speciation. Okay? He saw a bird with a smaller beak becoming a bigger beak. But how you get from a slime mold to a bird is something that they just have zero evidence for. Yes. Uh, we just so much appreciate you being here today. Uh, here's the, the big issue for, for all of, for me anyhow, and maybe you can answer this. How is it that something, a, a theory that really is so abs ridiculously absurd it couldn't possibly work, how is it that so many scientists are just ardent believers of evolution and, and pretty much exclude any other scientists out of their club, so to speak, because they don't believe in evolution. How is it that such a lie, from your perspective, could take hold of all the best minds in this world, or some of the best minds in this world, and, and have just pervaded our society? How, how would you answer something like that? Well, it's a very good question. And it's, it's funny, even on the way here, I was saying to my wife, and she was asking me, you know, with the, the details, I said, you know, the, the, the thing that's the most astonishing of all is how this ever got accepted. Because it's just ranked fiction. And I, I, I think I can sort of understand it, all right? But uh, it doesn't justify it. And it's, it's the nature of the scientific experiment, you see? Because you have, what you have to do when you're thinking about this whole phenomenon, you have to realize that you have to take, you have to separate what you're living with today that you can do experiments on, and you have to separate that from what took place in history that you can't do experiments on, okay? So, when, the, when Bacon introduced the concept of an experiment, the basic concept of an experiment was you would take a control that you wouldn't do anything to, a sample that you wouldn't do anything to, and then on an equivalent sample, you do an experiment, and you would watch it change. And by comparing the experimental sample with the control, you were <coughs> able to make a deduction about um, how that natural phenomenon was working. So you were doing your experiments on the naturally existing phenomenon. And it was very tempting to say, therefore, I know how it developed. But you, you, you couldn't do any experiments on it. It was probably also attractive to the sciences, even though there was no evidence for it. Um, if you were a scientist back then, and it's different today, it's 200 years later, you were suddenly, by insisting everything was natural born, and uh, that everything was created that way, you were suddenly giving the authority for the understanding of the whole, of, of, of the whole universe and, and the human race to the scientists. The scientists were suddenly in charge of everything. So when somebody was asserting that it was the natural world and natural phenomenon and natural selection, that would probably be attractive to an experimental scientist because he contains the understanding and the phenomenon to evaluate the whole of our world's existence. But what you have to remind yourself is that while he's able to do experiments on the here and now, there's nothing he can do about the historical development of events. 
Okay, we have an, we have another question here in the back. Uh, hi. Um, in the end, you mentioned that it was real science versus science fiction, and in your presentation, you gave many examples of why it was science fiction. I was wondering if you could give some of these scientific examples behind it, the true science of creationism. The true science of what? Uh, creation. That that idea. Well, I think um, the only place you can go, because what you have to recognize is you can't do experiments on the historical development. And the long and short of it is, to make it real simple, you can't get there without him. Because look what you got to do. you got to go from nothing to something. And that violates every physical law that you can imagine. So, and, 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 and God tells you how he got there. And that's the only alternative that you have if you want an explanation. OK, another question. And I'll just add to that. Uh, for you too is the flood as explained in the Bible is a great scientific explanation for a lot of the phenomena that we see. Uh, Dr. Mitty even talked about uh, the Grand Canyon and showing how the eruption of Mount St. Helens created Grand Canyon-like uh, structures around there. And so as we look at the Grand Canyon, that seems to have a very good explanation in the biblical account of the flood. So that's another specific example of how the Bible actually is better science than uh, what secular yeah, science is. Also, in that context, there's a lot of accumulating evidence that this flood that the Bible talks about was worldwide. I mean, you know, it wasn't, wasn't localized to the, the Mediterranean. OK, other questions? Hello. Did you have any part in the construction of recent or modern that we have today. I got bad hearing. What was the question? Did you have any part in the construction of more recent MRI scanners that we have today? Do, we, uh, try, do I have, did we have trouble back then or do we have no, trouble today? No, she's asking if you have a part in constructing the modern MRI scanners. Oh, yeah, sure. No, I'm, I'm, I'm the president of the company. That's what we do. We make MRI machines. <laughs> is, it, is it accurate to say if there's an MRI Anywhere in existence, it can be traced back to the work you're currently doing and have been doing. Or are other people now producing them? Oh, okay. That's a good one. Um, right after we got the first scan done, and there was a certain amount of publicity, I started getting phone calls from all the big companies. Got a phone call from General Electric, phone call from the German company, Sweet Siemens, phone, phone call from the company. They all wanted to come see the scan. Okay, so I was eager to have them go, and I was hoping we'd be able to business arrangement with them, uh, uh, we'd be able to license them to uh, with our patents because under the patents they were not allowed to build this scam. So they all they all came and they saw the magnet. And then they went home and they all made their own machines like they had no medicine. <laughs> so but well, we had the patents. So the only and, and, and we were at the point where they were extinguishing us. Okay, so we were gonna go extinct unless we did something about it. So we went to the court uh, to defend our patents. And in uh, 1997, the United States Supreme Court ordered General Electric to pay our company $127.8 million for their infringement. And also told them, don't do it, come on. So we're making MRI machines. Now, some of the patents have expired, so they don't last forever, they last 17 years, but we have a total of 150 patents. And we are making new inventions all the time. Different aspects of the MRI that are doing valuable things in different ways, and under the patent system, you can't use them. So uh, that's the way we're advancing our technologies versus our competitors. So can you understand the answer? Okay, and, but they're still making them, so if you want to buy one, he's the guy to talk to. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Kameen. Thank you again for being with us today. I have a question about punctuated equilibrium, um, which of course is the idea that organisms don't necessarily evolve over time, but quite suddenly, dramatically, 
uh, could do so. I'm wondering if you could poke a few holes uh, in that, you know, particularly I'm intrigued with the idea that most uh, sudden changes in organisms tend to produce death um, on the genetic level. Can you help us understand a little bit about why that is not a, a good patch or fill, if you will, for Darwin's theory? Well, it, it's a, a tough question to address, but um, one of the related issues um, are incidental mutations. Okay? And what the scientists have done today is, I think, fairly interesting. If you, if what there, there are a steady sequence of occurrence of you mutations that are not fake. So we are, as we're walking around, accumulating mutations. And one of the observations that's sort of interesting is that if you take the rate at which these mutations, these non-fatal mutations, are occurring and project back in time as to the point when they did not exist, and if you just mathematically project back in time, you can, you, you project back 6,000 years. In addition, if you now project forward in time, now ask yourself the question, well, at the rate at which they're accumulating, how long do I have to exist? 6,000 more years. That's the data that's coming out. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Thank you so much for being here. How old did scientists say the Neanderthal man was? How old is he? And what do you think about carbon dating? All right, well, okay. Uh, let me ask the second one. The carbon dating is tough. And the problem with carbon dating is that, in principle, it sounds like a good idea, because you look at the carbon, it's radioactive, it's decaying at a certain rate. So if you know the decay rate, you're going to take a sample that's got carbon in it, you should be able to date the rock and determine how old the rock is, except there's a problem. When you do that carbon dating, you are presupposing and assuming that the carbon inside the rock is not changing. Because you, you have to assume that the carbon that you're looking at today, that decay, is the same amount of carbon that was there 5,000 years ago. Well, but well, well, that's not the case. There's water washing in and out of these samples all the time and completely diluting and eliminating. And so the radioactive, and, and, and people have done radioactive dating on a variety of known samples, and, they got, and they're miles off from what the projected uh, date should be. So it, it's, it's, it's a reasonable way of estimating back 500 or 1,000 years. When you start talking about 1,000 years, it, it just doesn't uh, cover. And what was the other question? The other question was about Neanderthal man. Uh, how long ago did he supposedly live? Are you asking how long he supposedly lived or how long ago he actually lived? Both. So how long did our scientists say supposedly that he lived to fit with the evolutionary time scale and how long did he actually live based on your perspective? I don't know how long he lived. I don't think it was any different than anything else, but I don't think it is uh, expressed answer or not. Um, I do know that one theory is that Neanderthals were um, pre a pre-flood civilization, and you'll see in all the pictures they have that high uh, brow, that ridge brow, and uh, scientists uh, see that 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 your uh, ridge, brow ridge continues to grow as long as you live. And so if there's a population of people that were living for 500 years long before the flood, they may actually have that kind of ridge brow and that would uh, make up for the difference of the Neanderthal's facial structure compared to ours today. So that's a good clue that they would have been about 6,000 years ago and be pre-flood civilization. Okay, another question. I think Dr. Demady and I are, are going to go on the road and do this together. This is a lot of fun. Yes, sir. Um, they put together this clump of fossils, and they prove it to be a missing link. Well, they not pro they don't prove it. I'm sorry, wrong words. Um, they claim it to be a missing link, and they call it Lucy. What's the deal with that? Okay. <laughs> so he's asking specifically about Lucy. You know the missing, the supposed missing link. But maybe you can address how scientists are able to take a bone from over there, 
and then another bone from over there, and another bone from over there, and somehow put them together into a coherent skeleton. How are they able to get away with doing that? These are bones from the same skeleton that are being pieced together? They're, they're saying it is. You know, in the case with Lucy, they're saying they're all from the same uh, uh, species. Well, I, one of the things that they do is they look very carefully at the anatomy of the bone. You can tell from the anatomy of the bone what species it came to and uh, what part of the anatomy. So you could find the bones from a specific species of fish and you, and you could find it in different places, and you know they, you would know that they came from that one fish species. I think a great closing question, Dr. Domain, you started out by saying that you were here to protect us. Why is it so important that we need to understand that the Bible's account of creation is true, as opposed to evolution? Does it really matter all that much? Maybe you can just share from your heart why this is so important. Well, <clears throat> If you don't believe the Bible, and it's really key for all your gods and all your ways, you're going to make mistakes. I don't want to go into details of mistakes, but you're going to make them. And our culture is making mistakes at exponential rates. So we have, thou shalt not commit adultery. We have, thou shalt not commit murder. We have a set of laws and commands that God gave us. And if you take exemption, from God's creation, you take exemption from those laws, and then you create by not abiding all those laws, personal chaos. So I'm here to protect you from that personal chaos. So you guys understand, if you remove God as the creator, then you're able to remove him as the lawgiver, and ultimately, you can live however you want. And somebody asked a question about, it might have been Mr. Scary, how do you how do secular scientists get away with this? And it just shows you how powerful man's drive is to remove himself from God's rulership, such that he's able to come up with bizarre theories that don't really make sense, but everybody's willing to believe them. And so that's why Dr. Domanian has shared with us today, to, to realize and to, to show you how reliable scientific evidence shows that creationism, by God's direct work, actually impacts every decision that you make because your morals and all of your choices come from the lordship of God as creator. So we are so... Let, let me add... Yeah, go ahead. That I think it's useful. And when you speak of science, it's ten, there's a tendency to talk about science in a generic sense, in a general way. What you have to stop to realize is that today's scientists don't think about creation. Somebody who goes to graduate school, gets a PhD in science, he is hyper-specialized. And he's studying a particular enzyme reaction, and he's going to study that for the rest of his life. So you ask him questions about origins, you ask him questions about creation. He may have lots of opinion, but he does not have detailed knowledge. And he would like to stay away from the big picture. So the number of people who are daring and bold enough to consider how did the big picture come about of very, very few. And the average scientist doesn't want to go there because he knows he doesn't have the skill and the knowledge to assert his opinion and defend himself against criticism. So the, the, the number, the, the big picture people uh, in, who are scientists are very small and few in number. So we are so grateful that you've come to share with us today. Can we give him a great round of applause? And I hope that uh, beyond uh, what was very interesting, and I know some of this was a little bit higher than you're used to uh, hearing. You may have had some uh, trouble tracking with it. It was great to be exposed <clears throat> to a man who loves Jesus with all of his heart and yet is brilliant in the science field. And I hope for some of you kids, honestly, that something awakened in your heart that said, I want to study the next potassium problem. Or I want to understand how such and such works. And God will take that desire and shape that and use you to have a great impact on the world for his purposes. Yes, go ahead. I think it's Colossians. 
2, 3, or Colossians 12, 13, but very meaningful in the context of science. In Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, one of the things to take note of, which is kind of interesting, is that the great revolution in science came from the land where Christ was. It came from the Christian world. Now, there's no shortage of smart people in Asia, but it didn't come from them. The, the, the explosion of new knowledge, the explosion of new technology, the explosion of new science, just as Colossians teaches, in Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And I, I want you all to know that. You stick with him, you're going to have access to all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge the way we were able to get to the MRI. Amen. Thank you. Great way to end.